Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Harriet. I'm an alcoholic. My home group is the Carl Gables Group. And I'm delighted to be your, I was supposed to be one of your two speakers tonight. I'm sorry to say that Chico had an out of town problem and had to leave. And so, uh, here I am. I'm the speaker. I do not intend to be here for an hour and a half. <laughs> but I will, uh, share with you a little bit of my story. First of all, I want to thank Chris and, uh, the grapevine committees for asking me to be here. I couldn't be here last year. I was out of town. And so I'm delighted to be back here and to be your invited guest. I didn't imagine that it was this wonderful. Uh, people had told me what a great fun it was and how beautiful. And it is all of that. And uh, I thank the committee for asking me. My story begins in Pennsylvania. And um, I was an only child. And I really believe that being an only child helps in getting to be an alcoholic. I, um, I was self-centered uh, from the very beginning. I didn't understand the word in the big book of selfishness uh, because I was taught to be unselfish with things. And it wasn't until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous to find out that I had never learned to be unselfish with me, with my inner feelings. But I had um, a good, wonderful childhood. And um, the place that we went to in the summertime in the mountains, we always had bonfires, just like this one tonight. And uh, we to roasted our uh, hot dogs and um, weenies, we called them, and uh, then marshmallows and corn, corn in the husks. And uh, it was marvelous food and marvelous uh, times as a young girl growing up. I had a very um, privileged childhood. I was taught... Um, uh, many good things at uh, Sunday school and, and, and uh, church. Uh, not a great deal of church. My parents were not church goers, but they believed in sending me to church and with my grandmother. And it was a pleasant time. My, um, um, I believed in Santa Claus for a long time. In fact, um, I, I was a big girl when my mother finally said, you're embarrassing me. And uh, I was walking around and telling everybody that Santa Claus really was real. And uh, so I stopped saying it, but I'm not quite sure that I still don't believe in Santa Claus. But I did believe in the Easter Bunny, too, and the same cottage that we went to where the bonfires were. Every spring, along about Easter time, we'd say, well, let's go check on the cottage, see how it weathered the winter. And if we went on Easter Sunday, I always found some Easter eggs, and I found a great many of them. And I'd go running to my daddy and say, oh, I found another one, another one. And I didn't know until I was a big girl that he would, there were only six, and he kept hiding them over and over again. And so when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I believed everything you told me. And I'm so glad because I happened to be listening to the right people. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, it was 1956, and it was January the 14th, the day I took my last drink, and I came to a meeting that, if I remember correctly, would have been the following Monday. That was a Saturday. And so it would have been January the 16th that I came to you people and began to meet you. We were very small back in those days, and when a newcomer like myself walked into the Anana Club, which is no longer in existence, when I walked in, everybody came to talk to me. They knew I was new. It isn't like today where you can walk into a crowded room and perhaps nobody will pay any attention to you unless someone is with you and introduces you around. But just to walk in on your own and be a stranger, everybody came and said hello and sat down and talked. And I began to listen to these people because they shared their experience, strength, and hope with me. And I stayed sober. I never had to take another drink because I believed you. I believed you just as I believed in the Easter Bunny and maybe still do in Santa Claus. And so my childhood brought me up to uh, when I was about 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, and my family, uh, we lived in the country, and uh, what was then country, today it's part like Coral Gables in Miami, but in those days it was pretty far apart and the roads were not too good. 
But about midnight on Saturday night, my folks would have company, and they'd say, let's go downtown and have some lobster and steamed clams at Ray Hottles. And they'd have to take me because I was an only child, and they wouldn't leave me alone. And so we'd go down, and there's this little kid, nine, ten years old, with the grown-ups eating lobster at midnight. And uh, this particular night, somebody handed me a little brown glass or glass of brown stuff and said, drink this. It will help your indigestion. And I didn't know I had indigestion, but I was obedient, and I said, okay, and I, I drank it, and it was bitter. And, and I licked my lips because it left a little white foam on the top of my upper lip. Then I licked my lip like that, and it was good. And I swallowed it, and it went down into my tummy, and then it went up to my head, and then it just went all over, and it's going up and down my spine right this very minute because it changed me right then and there. I grew up. I wasn't 9, 10 years old. I was 19, 20, and as smart as anybody in the room. My lobster was bigger than anybody else's, and I was a grown-up, and I was adult, and it changed my whole personality, and I can remember it to this minute. And I have read uh, several books about alcoholism that tell me, if you remember your first drink, you're probably alcoholic because it was important. And I remember that first drink. It was very important. And I remember my second drink. It was a few years later. And I'd gotten the measles. And our doctor prescribed a little port wine. And he said, a little of port wine will help her get her strength back. And I want to tell you, it will. It will. But my daddy doesn't know what a little port wine was, so he brought the bottle. I was 15 years old. I was going off to college that fall. And certainly they could leave a 15-year-old going off to college alone for an hour or two while he and my mother went out. And when they came back, the bottle was half empty. I had passed out. I was been sick, and I had vomited. And when I came to, I said, wasn't that good? I drank for the effect. I drank for the effect most all of my life. Later on, I began to doctor it up with the ginger ale and the uh, juices and the olives and the uh, various uh, mixes that came along, and I, for a while, I uh, enjoyed the taste. But mainly I drank for effect. I know, to, I feel today that I was alcoholic from the very beginning. I'm one of those people, I believe, that was an alcoholic from the very beginning, and the reason I drank the way I drank was because I knew no other way to drink. I had to drink too much, too often, too long, because I knew no other way to drink. I did. I never crossed over what some of you call, and you may be right for you, uh, you say you crossed over an invisible line at some point in your drinking, that you had been a social drinker and that you enjoyed a drink. But at one point you, you, you crossed over that invisible line and you became an alcoholic. And I never did that. I was always an alcoholic from the first time I took that drink. From the first time I took that drink, I had the mental compulsion. I, when my parents would discuss anything going on at the club or if there was going to be a party, uh, I, my ears just perked up to see if there was going to be any liquor around. We had a very large house in the country. It was an old farmhouse and had been done over. And there were a lot of doors. And there was the preacher's door and there was the grocery door and there was the milkman's door and there was up here there was a door that we called the bootlegger's door. And when that doorbell rang, nobody rushed to it. But you knew that when you got to that door, there would be a little brown bag there with a bottle inside of it. And sometimes I was the one to do that. And inside of the bag was a bottle called Ritten, Rittenhouse. And one time somebody took the cap off, and I smelled it, and it smelled like perfume. And I loved it. And we kept it in the bathroom. It was kept on the bathroom with other medicines. If somebody downstairs wanted a cocktail or a highball in those days, and they'd say, well, you go up to the bathroom and get the bottle. And so if somebody would go up to the bathroom and get this bottle of Rittenhouse, I suppose it was, I, I don't know what was in it, bourbon, whiskey, the rye, but you'd go up there to get the bottle and you'd bring it downstairs and mix drinks. And I was always watching to see if maybe I could get a sip out of somebody's. And, of course, it's a, a still thing today when people have a drink in their hand. It's fun to give it to a child and see the child's reaction. Or sometimes you give it to a pet animal, a cat or a dog, and see their reaction. Well, today, of course, I think that's a terrible thing to do because it could be an alcoholic like me. Because then I'd go out in the kitchen and drain all the glasses. 
because once I had one sip of it, I wanted more. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. I just thought it was something good, and it was. It changed me. It made me different. By the way, I still like lobsters and clams at midnight if anybody's going out later. The um, going away to college, um, there's not much to tell you except that um, it was, a, in those days, under the auspices of the Methodist Church, and it was Depression time. And uh, just coming out of prohibition, in fact, I heard something on the radio or television yesterday to, uh, that it's uh, 1933, uh, an anniversary of sorts, that prohibition was repealed uh, 63 from 9 to 6, 60 years ago. That prohibition was repealed, and it doesn't seem that long, because to me it seems almost like yesterday, because we all got excited that now we could go and get a drink legally. And somehow or other, these, as I said, it was depression time and nobody had much money. I had been privileged that my father had done well business way and that we seemed to have uh, ample. And uh, certainly I had everything I needed, most anything I asked for and or wanted, I, I had. But now we, the boys occasionally would produce a bottle. And the important thing here is that in either my junior or senior year, perhaps both, I can remember going out at intermission time which we always did at those dances, the proms, and we would share one bottle between four people. It was always, we didn't have many cars and uh, not much money, so there were two couples always to a car and one bottle. And certainly it was a lack of money. They weren't very big bottles. And I remember giggling as soon as the bottle came out of its bo uh, bag or as soon as it was produced. And when the cap came off, I was excited. And I'd get my turn. And I would take a swig or two, and I would start to giggle. I I was affected. This proves to me, in my own mind, that it's mental. I was drunk before, at, at the age of 18 and 19, just knowing that there was a bottle to be had in a minute. As soon as I reached out my hand, I would have that alcohol. And I had no idea that I was an alcoholic, and had been since, uh, since forever. But that phenomenon of craving came as soon as I had one drink and I wanted more. And then the next thing I, I come to remember, we'd go into the dance after intermission time, and um, I, I might be dancing with Chris. And all of a sudden, I'd, I'd look up, and there I'm dancing with Pat. And I'd think, what happened? What happened? I don't remember what happened. And it wasn't until met to, almost 30 years later when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that I knew I'd had blackouts when I was 18 years old from just having a few sips out of a shared bottle. But that prom dance, I'd had blackouts. Um, I graduated and went home to Pennsylvania and was introduced through my parents to a young man and his crowd who were much older than I. I graduated when I was 19. And this crowd was older and sophisticated beyond belief. And they were so out in the world. And I was so... Um, well, you know how we are. We're just not very bright and not, not, not very mature is the word I should use. I, I just was an immature 19-year-old, and I, I'm not sure I was uh, had a brain of 19. Um, very immature. And this older crowd, and by that age, I mean they were all of 25. But to me, they, they, they could have been 35 or 45. They were just, they've been around. And uh, they could have plucked them out of the movies. They were so sophisticated. And we wore our tuxedos and our pretty long evening gowns and went to parties and dances. And it was a time of uh, great fun. And, and I drank like they drank because they, I found too, as I remember now, most of them were full-blown alcoholics. And uh, I was too, but I didn't know it. And there came a time, though, that uh, I was the one that could hold my liquor. Um, this was after I began having the blackouts, and then I began to be able to hold it. And we used to drive up from wilkes to Scranton to uh, go dancing at the Hotel Casey. And along about the middle of the evening, uh, someone would say, well, who's going to get us home? I'm drunk. And they'd say, oh, Harriet will get us home. She drinks like a man. She's got uh, hollow legs. And some of us go through this stage, and I did. And then that disappeared after a while, and I could no longer tolerate it again. And uh, I had no idea that uh, alcoholism was the way it was. Um, my parents began to be concerned for my drinking, and uh, things were said, but no one knew what to do about it. Um, this was 1930s, 
and I had applied. My father told me we were broke, that he no longer had all that money, and our home had to go. And um, we went through a period of uh, financial difficulties, and I got a job. I had been scheduled to be a school teacher, but in those days, school teaching didn't pay much, so I never did teach. And you want to be awfully glad that your children or grandchildren never came to my school. So I, 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 went, I got a job with the government, and they sent me to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And while in Philadelphia, I lived in a house that rented out rooms, and my room was directly over the front porch. This was down in South Philadelphia, what was then called the Girard Estate. And um, we used to bring a lot of, uh, there was a lot of beer down there and wine. That was an Italian section, too. And so um, I would bring the beer back to my room, and while I had kitchen privileges, I kept it in my room because it was uh, easier to get to. You know, who wants to walk all the way down the kitchen? So I kept it in the windowsill, and one day I decided I was drinking too much. We were going over to New Jersey to do our drinking on weekends because of the blue laws in Pennsylvania. And at, and I was a pretty smart gal, and I figured out that I was drinking too much. And um, who needed to go uh, to Camden to drink on Sundays? Uh, so I'd bring the beer home. And I needed a hobby. And so I bought a hobby, uh, painting, painting by the numbers. And I'd be there painting and reaching over for the turpentine and beer, and oh, thank God I got the beer when I wanted it and the turpentine when I wanted it. But by accident, I knocked one of those beers out that rolled down the the uh, roof, uh, all the way down the gutter, of the rain gutter. And I was young and thin and athletic, and I went out after it. And as I crawled back up through the ice and the snow, it occurred to me that this was not social drinking. And then I began to be concerned because my dates would say to me, well, we had a, a pretty good time tonight. I hope that uh, we can go again next Saturday, and uh, um, that'll be very nice. And um, then the other times they bring me home and say, oh, my God, do you have to drink that way? And I, I, I'm not going to take you out again. You, 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 you've uh, ruined my evening with your drinking. Or I can remember getting through one evening till about 10 o'clock, and I was so, they told me not to drink. And they said, no, don't drink tonight. And so I wouldn't drink, and I'd pout. And I'd sit in the corner someplace and just be miserable. And they'd come over and say, oh, for God's sake, take a drink. Okay, and then I'd get in the life of the party again. Uh, I never knew when I was going to uh, embarrass anybody. And then when I did, I was terribly, terribly um, upset because I, I was taught to be a lady. I had been sent to very good schools, and all the little extras that little girls uh, in my age and in my society had. Uh, besides uh, regular schools, I went to elocution lessons and um, what we called um, the ballroom dancing. And at, at ballroom dancing, we learned to dance, but we also learned our manners. And we learned to wear our white gloves and to wear earrings and to wear pretty dresses and little black patent leather pumps and to stand up when our elders come into the room. And in those days, we were taught to curtsy and the little boys bowed to us. And, and we learned the social graces of our time and place. And when I began to be a drunk, I didn't remember those social graces. And I'd come home bedraggled or my parents would come and get me and they would say, this isn't what we taught you, this isn't how we brought you up. And I hurt them so badly. Um, World War II came along and I was employed by the government and uh, people began starting back at getting into uniforms and many of my friends were lieutenants and going out to war and uh, I was being reprimanded for absenteeism and for doing sloppy work, my boss said to me one day, do you think today you could type more than one page? You know, all my stuff was in the wastebasket. I couldn't type without typographical errors, and I couldn't do anything without making mistakes, and I'd throw it all in the wastebasket. And so finally, I thought to myself, I'd better join one of these services too and get out of this place. It's getting me drunk. <laughs> and so I looked over the uniforms very carefully. World War II produced the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. And I didn't care for that uniform, nor did I care for the, um, I, I figured they'd send for me to come right back to that particular place. Little did I know they wanted me as far away as possible. <coughs> but I discarded that idea. And I looked over the other women's uniforms because I was patriotic. I wanted a good-looking uniform. And so I chose the Marine Corps. In World War II, the Lady Marines wore an olive drab uniform with a red ascot tie. And that's really what got me. 
I was a brunette and I liked red and the red silk tie around the cap. And so the day came when I just couldn't get to work. I was so sick. And I made it to Richmond, Virginia to take care of getting into the Marine Corps. And by the time I got there, I needed a drink very badly. And I didn't want to take a drink because I didn't want to smell. I probably did already, but I didn't want to enhance it. <coughs> and so I, I got into the uh, building where it was, and I answered a lot of questions, and my hands were shaking. And I was concentrating on looking good and putting on that fake smile that we know so well and looking on the outside as if we're healthy and strong. And on the inside, I was qu quavering and frightened and scared, and uh, I wanted to drink. And so I answered all the questions best I could, and I raised my hand and took the oath, and he shook my hand, and then he said, Welcome to the United States Navy. And I kind of backed up, and I can remember it to this moment. I said, Sir, I came here to join the Marine Corps. And he said, Honey, you got up on the wrong floor, and you're in the Navy now. And I always remember at that point the time after I'd been sober a very, very short time, a few days really, and I started going to our intergroup office here in Miami. I took my last drink here in Miami the day I arrived. It was January the 14th, 1956. Um, comes, uh, uh, today is December the 4th. Um, a, a month and a few days from now, I will be 38 years sober. <laughs> Thank you. Due to the grace of God, I found this fellowship. I knew about you before, but I didn't come until I was ready. I um, the um, I got my uniform, and I, I was in the Navy. Oh, I started to tell you, I used to go to the intergroup office. Our intergroup office in 1956, and as far as I know, it was there for three or four years. It was downtown Miami in the Pacific Building. It isn't there anymore. In fact, it was uh, Im imploded. And they did it on, I saw it on television, and I kind of cried a little bit. A few tears came to my eyes because it was important to me. Intergroup, I'd go there almost every day, and our intergroup secretary's name was Paul. And I'd stay there for maybe 10 minutes or 30 minutes, and I'd, he'd share a letter with me, or he'd share a telephone call with me, and we'd talk. And then when I got up to leave, he'd say, now, don't worry, Harriet. The man upstairs is looking out for you. Now, I had never heard that expression in my life. I really believed there was a man upstairs taking care of me. And I would go down the elevator and out, and I would turn around and wave to the man upstairs. I didn't know that. But that man upstairs was watching over me because I never took another drink. Um, the other day, I watched another landmark be imploded. They did the Gold Ocean Mile Hotel on Miami Beach. I guess it's closer to Hollywood. And we had several big AA conventions in the, my early days. I know there was one either in 57 or 58. Wesley P. was the chairman. And uh, we had several conventions of that Gold Ocean Mile when there were, they weren't like two or three thousand like we have today in, in Orlando. The Florida State Convention, there was close to three thousand people there. But at the Gold Ocean Mile, we were lucky if we had a thousand. But it was big to us because we weren't as big. And I, I never, I have to tell you a little bit. You see, I never had a sponsor uh, because in those days everybody knew each other and we all talked to each other. And the two, when I grew up, my parents um, were being sponsored into various civic organizations. And I can remember my father saying, "Oh, I'm going to sponsor old Joe into this club. He, he's a good man. He's a man of principle." And he said, I like doing business with Joe. He's an honest man. And he says, we've checked his bank account. We've checked his morals. And he's a good man. We're going to sponsor him. And then they might say, well, we're not going to sponsor old so-and-so. He's a liar and a cheat. He has no principles. And besides, he's been bankrupt a couple of times. We won't. So I knew what sponsors were. I knew a sponsor was someone who was going to examine my bank account and my morals. And they wouldn't let me in. So I, I, when I finally heard the word sponsor, I shied away from that. But instead, I had many people that I called, I, I didn't know it then, but they were my role models. I wanted to be like them. And these were the people who had been sober a little while, and they had sparkle in their eye, and when they walked, they, they, they walked with the, you know, they just kind of were alive. And these were the people I wanted to be like. And we had one member whose name was Ed B., who was sober 16 years. He had more, most sobriety than anybody else in Dade County at that time, I think, probably in the South Florida. And um, I talked to Ed on hours, all of us did, and there were some ladies, 
um, Eve M. Eve M. hadn't come down from New York yet, but Eve S. and um, a lady named Ruth and uh, some others. And these were the people that I used as my role models. Today I would call them sponsors. And if you, I believe in sponsorship. I think it's very important, particularly in the days now when we have so many members of a group and you can get lost unless you've got a sponsor. So I, I urge it. Um, the, um, um, I got through the Navy days, and then, as many of you know, I um, was a little jealous because most of my friends had gone overseas, and um, the waves did not go overseas in those days. So I went overseas after I was discharged and points, and I, I became an officer, a uh, lieutenant, you know, and uh, got away with my drinking. People covered for me. I had so many um, people that uh, enabled me to keep on drinking, and my disease of alcoholism progressed. had a lot of fun. And if you didn't have some fun while you were drinking, I'm sorry, because I did. I had a lot of fun. But it got worse and, and more embarrassing and more humiliating as time went on. And I got sicker. Our disease is a progressive one. Uh, and, and it never gets better. It, we think it's going to be different. And of course it does. It gets different. It gets worse. It gets worse every time. Uh, it's threefold. And I knew that from the very, I know now that I, from the very beginning, that I had that compulsion and the mental compulsion. And I had the obsession and the craving, physical, mental, and spiritual. And as my disease progressed, so did my spirituality. I had been brought up to go to church, but I was not a religious person and never forced to be in any church. But I was uncomfortable, and I knew that I was drifting away from God. Uh, I knew that uh, I was bad. And it took you people to tell me that I was not bad, that I was very sick, and that I could get better, I could recover that I didn't have to go to a reform school and get good again, that I was a good at heart, but this disease had just forced me into the kind of life I had to leave, live. My, my illness uh, let me uh, accept a position in North Africa right after the war. But that's where I met my Arab. And he wasn't any ordinary fellow. He was a chieftain. He was a kaid, which is like being the mayor of uh, Miami. Maybe not quite, mayor of South Miami. And uh, he was the mayor of, a, of an oasis called Usada. And we rode our camels into the Sahara in the sunset. And it was all very romantic, I thought. Some of this I know I, I've, I've dreamed it up some, but basically it's just true. And I know it was there, but I, I, it's like a movie to me. Uh, I can think back to the um, Rudolph Valentino and Lillian Gish and all those early movies when they were riding the Sahara. And I was there. And the State Department frowned on this and sent for me. And as we rode those camels back into Busada and my Arab, and I wish I could remember his name. <laughs> and uh, and they, they sent me home. The State Department frowned on all this. But I love that burnoose that my Arab was wearing. And that burnoose, it, it just, it was, it was like a cape with a hood on it. And I just loved it. And he liked my navy raincoat, so we traded. And I wore the Bernouse home as an evening wrap, and I wrapped it around myself, and I lurked in corners and pulled that thing up over my eyes, and I thought I was a spy. I was very weird. And in a moment of truth, I looked at this darn thing, and it was not made of white silk. It was not glamorous. It was made of brown wool and full of holes and full of moth. It, it, it just was moth-eaten, and it stunk. It literally stunk. It had been wrapped around too many goats and sheep and dirty things. It was terrible. When I ended up, finally, in the fall of 1955, after being fired from my job, and they asked me to resign, which is a nice way of saying you're fired, and I had been in somebody's mental ward since September of 1955, and I was there until January the 9th of 1956, the week before I came to you. And during that time that I was in somebody's mental ward, you see, they didn't know what to do with me. I was not physically sick yet, not physically sick enough. So they put me in mental wards, and they were all locked wards. First, I was in the Duval County Hospital in Jacksonville. Then I was in another facility in Duval County on the third floor of a place, a dry and out spot up in the Trout River. I can't remember the name of it. And there some AA people came to call on me. Two ladies came. And I didn't know who they were, but they were so beautiful. They walked in, the sunlight was shining, and it just caught their hair. And their hair was clean. 
and it shone. And they were both dressed in white or light colored clothes and there wasn't a spot on them. And they put their hands out to me and their hands were clean and their nails were polished and they wore stockings that did not have runs in them. And they had shoes that had nice heels on them. They weren't all run down and dirty. And they said, my name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic. And the other lady said, my name is Dina, and I'm an alcoholic. And my mouth was open because I'd never seen two alcoholic women before. And these were ladies like I'd been taught about back there in school, you know, with the white gloves and the back flat leather shoes and the little perfume behind the ears. These were the ladies that I'd been taught to be. And I had turned into a drunken slut. And I wanted what they had. And they told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. And a fellow named Joe came in, a fellow named Joe B. And Joe sat by my bedside, and he reached over on the little night table, and he said, what is this little booklet here? And it was a little thin magazine with a brown wrapper around it. And if you move that wrapper around a little bit, you could see what the little magazine was. It said, A.A. A. Grapevine. And he says, what is this? I says, I don't know, but it comes in the mail every damn month. He says, why don't you take the cover off? And I remembered that all of my sobriety. We have to take the cover off. We have to look underneath. We have to look inside. That four step, that ten step, these step tell us, take the cover off and look at it square in the eye. Illuminate. Turn on the lights and look at our defects. Turn on the lights. Open the door. Take the covers off. Look inside. Look inside of me. He said, why don't you take the cover off? And I just looked at him because I didn't know what a grapevine magazine was and I didn't know what he meant. But I remembered it. In those days, the magazine like this, it came with just a brown wrapper around it and you could slide it on or off. Of course, later on, they found out that they had to protect our anonymity through the mails and they began to put it in envelopes. And it didn't say AA on it, it just says 1980, which is the post office box where it comes into and out of. P.O. Box 1980, it's on the magazine, Great Grapevine. And when you read your history of all this, it's all in the books, you can read it. If you, if you love your fellowship, the fellowship that saved your life, you should read your history and find out where you've come from. And so I began to... Uh, find out a little bit about Alcoholics Anonymous. They took me to some meetings, but I had to drink again. And I came to Miami, Florida, and I arrived by train on January the 14th, 1956. And I was drinking that night, Friday night the 13th. And I was sick, and I was tired of being sick. And I was trying to drink on that terrible train that goes this way, and the water cooler, which had warm water in it, full of some kind of chemicals, and those little flat cups you pull out, and they're flat, and you have to use two or three hands to get them open, you have to use two hands to get the top off the bottle, and you have to pour, and you need six hands, and you're sick, and I'm crying, and I needed to drink, and I knew this, I, I wasn't going to last, I knew I was through, and I got up off that train at about six o'clock, on Saturday morning, and that was my birthday. I was 39 years old that day. And as I was about to take another drink, and I had to have it, I said, please, God, no more. And I put the drink down. I didn't know for years that that's a variety of a spiritual experience. One of the definitions that the big book tells us, and I think it's in the 12 and 12 rather, one of the definitions of a spiritual experience is being able to do with God's help what you could not do by yourself, or words to that effect. And up until that moment, I had to take that drink. And I didn't want to, but I had to have it. But when I asked God for God's help, I was able to put it down, never to pick it up again. That's one variety of a spiritual experience that I did not recognize. I did recognize the fact that I was free. 
didn't know it was freedom, but I knew that I was something happened. I felt it physically lift off my shoulders. And somehow I knew I would not have to drink. And I called intergroup office, and I was directed to the only member at that time on Key Biscayne. They didn't have a group over there in 1956, but there was one fellow who was a member, who acknowledged he was a member. His name was Bill, and he began taking me to meetings. And I became active in my group immediately. They asked, they didn't ask me anything. They told me what I was going to do. They told me I was going to be the program chairman. I said, I don't know how to do that. And they said, here's 16 names and phone numbers. You call them and arrange to exchange meetings. Oh, that's easy. I like to do that. And I, I began to know everybody in Dade County. In 1956 until about 1966, really, we knew most everybody. And suddenly, suddenly, we began to grow, grow, grow. And now I see people here tonight that I swear I've never seen before. And you seem to know me, and I'm sorry, but I don't always remember names. And, and I'd love to know all of you personally, and I just can't. But... Um, in the old days, it was great fun when we did know each other. And I became a subscriber of the Grapevine magazine very early on. And I brought with me just a few of the old ones that I had picked up at random this morning. I have um, not kept all of my grapevines. I've given many away. I believe in taking a meeting. I used to always take one with me when I went to a meeting. Today, I've, <laughs> except for tonight, I have never gone out to a meeting without taking my big book. And tonight, dear Harry, who's a new member with six months of sobriety, brought his little big book with him. And I'm happy to have it in my hand. It's really only a security blanket, that's all. You know, I'm 37 years sober. Shucks, I need I need a security blanket. I'm not completely grown up yet. Uh, it's, it's nice growing up, but I like to still hang on to my blankets. Um, I began to read the grapevines. And um, these four I picked up, I... I glanced over them quickly this afternoon to see if there was something I could share with you. And uh, there's several things I'm going to share. Um, I do want to tell you, though, that um, uh, not only did I become program chairman, but treasurer, and they sent me to intergroup. I didn't know what I was doing, but I went. And I think it's important. So many times a person goes to an intergroup meeting or a general service meeting, and we tell you ahead of time, now this is a six-month job. You go to intergroup for six months, and each time you come back and you report to the group what happened. And if you're like I was, you may not understand anything that's going on, and I didn't. But I tried. And I think the important thing that I learned, or the things that I learned, were the discipline of getting up and going to those meetings every Thursday night or Wednesday night, whatever night they were, of getting there and being on time, answering the roll call, representing my group, feeling that my group trusted me to serve them. I, according to the traditions, I became a trusted servant. And they trusted me to serve them in this capacity, and I did my best at that time of my sobriety. It was not very good as I look back on it, but it was the best I could do then. And by the grace of God, and through the growing up in this fellowship, 20-some years later, I was able to serve you as a delegate from South Florida, and go to New York for two years to attend a conference and, and represent you there. Uh, and, and so the things I learned in my early sobriety carried me up right up to today and into my workplace and into my living conditions. I, I've learned to discipline myself and learn to care about other people and do unto them as I would be done by. The um, staying sober has been relatively easy for me. I've never wanted a drink, desired a drink, since the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. But living according to these 12 steps, living according to the principles, spiritual in nature, is not always easy. And, and uh, there's one of the little things I picked up in one of these books today. Uh, let's see, I think it's the one I put two paper clips on. Uh, says, um, here it is. This is from 1964, October of 1964, and just a little line at the bottom. It's easy to tell when you're on the right road. It's all uphill. I love it. I was on the downside so long, and, 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 and uh, the right road is all uphill. And right above this is a, an article called Only a Gimmick, How a Red Poker Chip Helped This AA Make a First Anniversary, and it was written by a lady from, or a man, I don't know, 
from Miami, Florida. The initials are M.T., Miami, Florida. And she said, one, he or she, one night, fixing up a hurry-up supper before a meeting, I opened a package of Frankfurters and out fell a red chip. It was an advertising gimmick. <laughs> you know, you get a red chip out of a Frankfurter package. What I saved this article for is from 1964. There were some articles on depression and suicides, alcoholism and suicides. And in 1964, I was going through a very rough period in my sobriety. My husband, oh yeah, I got married after I came to AA. I met the knight on the white horse. I said, oh, look at that cute fella. And they said, no, not yet, but I didn't listen. I was only about two months sober. And I married him in June. I was five months sober. And when you're new, some of you who are new today, listen to these people when they say, no, not yet. You know, there's a reason for it. We tell you not to make any big decisions for about a year, at least a year. We mean it because we've been through it. That's what we share is experience, strength, and hope. And while I loved my guy, he couldn't stay sober. And then I found out he had a history of mental instability and some other things that I found out. But I didn't know that. I had to have him. And when they said, no, not yet, they meant it, but I had to have him. And I, it was a great experience, but it was rough. And I did think, I did have depressions, and I did think about, so I thought more about murder. And twice I darn near did it. But I saved this article because it's because of that. And, and I, I still save it. Who knows? Who knows? This is from um, June 1977. We had a wonderful member. He was a very dear friend of mine. He's dead now. If he were alive, he'd be sober close to 50 years. His name was Barry. Barry, by trade, was a writer. That was his profession. And he was also a very good AA member. And he was what we, uh, the tenth uh, tradition tells us about. He was a special worker. We paid him to do some writing for us. You and I, you know, we pay those people up there in New York. We pay the staff members. When you put your money in the basket, your money goes to AA. And when you send your percentage of your take to New York, it's paying the salaries of the people in New York. And Barry wrote the pamphlet that many of you are familiar with called Living Sober. That Barry wrote that. He also put together the pamphlet that I like very much. It's uh, called The Twelve Traditions Illustrated. And many of you know I carry that with me most of the time. Well, he wrote many, many, many articles for the Grapevine magazine, and I saved this one because it was about the Twelfth Tradition, and it talks about honest perspective and the eternal spiritual values, and here's what I have underlined. He says, it seems to me that the Twelfth Tradition is saying I should learn to treat everyone, in AA or not, with respect, courtesy, and compassion, and never try to take advantage of my AA membership. You know, this is all about humility. The Twelfth Tradition has nothing to do with anonymity. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions. And I didn't do this by myself. I did it with the help of a power greater than myself. And I should never try to take advantage of it. This one is from... November of 1972, and I have marked... See, I used to write on the outsides of these, the things that I was keeping them for. And then when I was asked to do a tradition meeting or a step meeting, I would pick out the ones that I wanted to refer to. This one of November 72, I have written Ebby's message on page 5. Ebby was the man who could not stay sober, but he brought the message to, Al to Bill Wilson. And he said, what was the message that Ebby brought to me? Story. He brought me a kind of communication and evidence that even Dr. Sukworth could not give. Here was one drunk talking to another. What was his message? All AAs know what it was. Honesty with oneself, leading to a fearless moral inventory of character defects, a revelation of these defects to another human being, the first humble and faltering steps away from isolation and guilt, willingness to face up to those we had harmed, making all possible restitution. A thorough house cleaning inside and out was indicated. Then we were ready to devote ourselves in service to others, using the understanding and language of the heart, seeking no gain or reward. Then there was that vital attitude of dependence on God or a higher power. 
And then this one, I read it again today, and I cried again. It's, I've marked the, the article, To Finland with Love. It was written by Dr. Earl Emma, whose story was in the first and second, I guess the third edition of the big books. It's um, Physician Heal Thyself, Earl Emma. And he tells the story of going to Finland 17 years after AA started there. And he tells the story about how a hopeless, pitiable, broken alcoholic named Usko left his native Finland and slopped his way to the United States and somehow found his way to California and found AA. And then he heard from a drunken friend back in Finland. Finland, And he says, I have to go back to Finland and tell my friend about AA. And he did. And 17 years later, Dr. Earl visited them. And they treated him to a sauna bath. And they were in that sauna when all of a sudden everybody got still and they had an AA meeting in the sauna bath. Then they all went out and jumped in the icy waters of the there in Finland. And they were all shouting out the words, Kletos, ah-ah, Kletos, ah-ah, Kutos, ah-ah, Kutos, ah-ah. Almost everywhere in Europe, A-A is pronounced ah-ah, A is ah. And you go in the countries I've been in, it's all ah-ah. So he said, he says, what, what are they saying over and over again? He says, every time we do something we all love, we say, thanks, A-A. Kutos, ah-ah, Kutos, ah-ah. And, and the, he spent Christmas with these people. And the article, as you read it, I cry, as I said, I cried again today when I cried. And I've saved that all these years. Um, I have many great friends like this um, that I've marked for some special reason. Then one year I got mad at the grapevine. They started changing the covers. And they had very slick covers and fancy pictures on them. And I wrote and I said, I don't like this. I can't write on them anymore. And I got a snippy little bit letter back from my friend, my dear friend, Anne. She says, get a different pencil. <laughs> so I got a different pencil. When I was delegate in 1977, we had a big brouhaha at conference over the gray pages of the grapevine. The gray pages were about three or four pages, and they were gray, and they contained excerpts from magazines and newspapers about alcoholism. And there was a disclaimer saying that this is not Alcoholics Anonymous, not the opinion of Alcoholics Anonymous, but things that might be of interest to AA members about alcoholism. And I loved them because uh, they just brought us up to date on some scientific things or just things that had happened in the field of alcoholism, and I loved them. But uh, many people thought that um, they didn't belong in our magazine. And uh, at, at, at conference, you're only allowed so many minutes to speak when there's a discussion. And usually it, one or two, there's one or two people who go over the limit and they get a bell rung on them and they sit down. And sometimes there are people who uh, don't hear the bell the first time and they get the bell and the bell and the bell. And we had one of those at my conference and it was over the gray pages. And I don't remember which way he was wanting it to go, but the gray pages stayed in until about five years ago, I guess. And finally they decided that they had to go. And I got mad over that. So I called and I canceled my subscription. Now I'm sorry, because I haven't been able to take a ten step with them yet, and I have to call up and say, I'm sorry I was such a kid about this, but I better subscribe to the Grapevine. It's a wonderful tool. This Grapevine magazine and this Grapevine Roundup is a wonderful tool for sobriety. You know, we come in here to enjoy our lives, or to be appreciative of uh, everything that goes on. Look up here at the sky now. This, it, it's just beautiful to be out here in the open air and to enjoy life. We didn't come in here to die. We didn't come in here to be old fogies. We didn't come in here to be a temperance union. We came here to enjoy our living and to grow up. And I wish you all success and happiness and continued sobriety. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.